in the beginning of November, we had 700 subscribers. Over the weekend, we just went past 50,000. We had a video that got over 700,000 views and then everything kind of followed from that. We started getting like a lot of comments on the videos of like, oh, this is like diary of a CEO. I think sometimes people mean it like as an insult or a diss, but I find it do you have any advice for anyone that is starting on zero subscribers? So here's what I would say. There's three phases of content creation on YouTube. So phase one is... Okay, so welcome to The Callum Johnson Show. We're doing this one a little bit differently. So we just passed 50,000 subscribers on the channel. And we've just been in a tear recently doing so many interviews. I've been in Miami to Atlanta, New York, London. And I wanted to do an episode just to kind of take a breath answer some of your questions and just go a bit deeper on this one and and everything that's been happening behind the scenes have an incredible <laughs> assistant i don't even know what to call you um just call me meg yeah meg <laughs> <laughs> who's going to be asking some of your guys questions and i'm going to be we're just going to be rolling through it so um yeah meg let's get to it okay let's, cool let's number one. um so first question for you um how did you go from working a nine to five to doing a podcast um was there a reason behind it or um, a motivation yeah okay um so it's an interesting story and i think there's like there's several layers to the story um and particularly like the reason why i do this i think is interesting and it's funny i was having a conversation with sean who's like on my team he helps us with brand sponsorships and brand deals um and we were talking about like what's the mission like, what's the mission of the podcast? Like, why are we doing this? And I was like, that's a good, like, that's a good question. I really wanted to reflect on what the mission was. And at the time, the way that it worked out was when I was flying from London uh, to New York. So I'm or from New York to London. So from JFK to Gatwick. And I'm on the plane and I have my laptop in front of me. And like my one task for that flight was to come up with the mission in like a very concise, succinct sense. Um, and so no internet, nothing happening, economy flight, as you do, I went pretty deep and I like reflected on certain stories, even from my childhood. And I came up with like a very specific reason of why I'm doing the podcast. And it actually kind of answers both questions mm -hmm. of why I even left my nine to five to do it in the first place. So, you know, what? let me just read it out and here's how it starts. So it goes, I heard Oprah say this and it resonated. The root of most people's dysfunction is you don't feel like you are good enough. You don't feel like you are worthy. You do not truly yet own your own essence. And so when I thought about that, there's been three moments in my life where I felt lost or a void of confidence in who I am or what I'm capable of. In hindsight, these times always set the stage for my proudest moments. And so here's where I go next. One year into my career, I'm working in strategy consulting. At the time, it seemed like my dream job. It was everything that I wanted coming out of university, but then it slowly became a nightmare. And so it's, eight, it's February of 2020 and the world is shutting down because of COVID. Remote work, isolation, cities are clearing out. There's so much fear, uncertainty. Added into the mix, I was completely useless at my job with no sign of improvement. Every move I made was the wrong one. Even routine tasks like sending emails or designing presentations, even going to like the company happy hours where you're just mingling and like networking and talking just didn't feel right. I felt completely useless across the board. The worst thing was is that I felt like a burden to my team. I was the inexperienced analyst that was untrainable, didn't fit and wasn't getting any better. And I felt like a waste. And I felt so deeply responsible for it all. I tried everything to correct it, asking for feedback. I even started doing like courses outside of work, working longer hours and nothing worked. If anything, the more I tried, the worse it got. And I felt ashamed. It felt like a thousand cuts to my confidence. Each shortcoming just chipping away. Not only are you useless in this role, you're irrecoverable. Sounds very dramatic. <laughs> and there was only one thing that worked. I made a bet on myself. At the time, it felt like an insane and even ludicrous, foolish decision. And it made zero sense to anyone but my family and me. I quit. And I just had to trust it would work. I was smart enough, courageous enough, talented enough that I could leave that job and figure something out, even though I had no idea what it was, but I had to believe that I could figure it out. I had to trust who I thought I was and act in alignment with that belief. And so I just did it. 
And uh, at the time I was actually, so I was living in New Jersey, but I took like a short vacation to Atlanta. I was just like, I'm booking a trip to Atlanta. I'm just going to go there and see what happens. Um, and I remember I did that first week in Atlanta and I had three more weeks after that. And after that first week, I was just kind of chilling. I took some time to kind of reflect and just gather my thoughts on it. And I really built the conviction to leave the job. And so as soon as I got back, I told my manager straight away. I remember it was one of the most euphoric feelings I felt stepping away from that. And I left that job with nothing else lined up. And it was really funny because I had so much anxiety at the time about like, oh, you know, I'm young in my career. Like I should have something lined up before I leave. But I felt so unhappy. I knew I had to move. And a week after I left that job, um, I actually got another job offer from an early stage startup that was like the perfect opportunity for me. And so I write in my notes, I say, God intervened. And it slowly built my confidence back. I felt like an asset again. I felt like a value add. I felt heard and respected. And that meant everything to me at the time. And I remember this kind of goes into the story of even starting the podcast. I'm working this new job. It's a very early stage startup. There's about 10 of us. And so often you're in meetings with like the CEO or the founder. Um, and he'll even ask me questions. At the time, I was the youngest person on the team, but he'll ask me for my opinion. And so it's one Monday morning, I'm in a team meeting, it's town hall style. And we went around the room and everyone had to share, what would they do if they weren't working here and money was not a consideration? So if you could be doing anything with your life, what would you be doing? And when it came to me, I said that I would start a podcast where I interview people that I find inspiring, that have incredible stories of how they overcame adversity. A few nods around the room as I explain my vision. And then the CEO says, I can see you doing that. Like you should just try it. And at that moment, it was like one of those other times where I kind of like, I felt like I had to bet on myself. And so I just started doing it. And I started a podcast. One year later, I left my job to do the podcast full time. Another leap of faith. Then I moved back home uh, with my mom to further commit to the podcast. Another leap of faith. And then it starts to blow up. And now I spend all my time doing this thing. Um, and it started as an experiment and there's actually there's more steps and like things that were happening in between in the story but it is actually also that simple it started with a bet and the bet got progressively bigger and bigger and it went from making no sense to making complete sense and that's exactly how it should be i don't know we've had a lot of conversations recently uh, with guests that have like left their job and then built successful companies. And there's always a point where it makes no sense what they were doing. And then in hindsight, it makes all the sense in the world. And it's like, you have to trust your instinct. And my story is very much like that. So yeah, that's, wow. that's question one. I kind of went, <laughs> went deep on that one. I feel motivated. I can't lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it brings us on to the next question. Um, so do you have any advice for anyone that is starting on zero subscribers? Yeah, um, okay. And, and this is an interesting one as well because I was at maybe not zero, but just to kind of give the like timeline of the podcast because it's been quite a quick rise once it started going. In November of 2023, in the beginning of November, we had 700 subscribers. Over the weekend, so what is that? Like mid March, mm -hmm. we had we just went past fifty thousand. So it was like a really steep incline, and I say that because I remember what it was like to feel like not really having anyone tuning into the content, and I really had to like kind of go through the mud of figuring out how to get traction on this. Yeah. So I I feel like I can give a good answer to it. So here's what I would say. I was listening to this podcast. It's called the Think Media Podcast. They do a lot of videos on YouTube and like how you can grow on YouTube and all this stuff. And their founder, his name is Sean Cannell. He says this thing where he says there's three phases of content creation on YouTube. So phase one is what he calls the quantity phase. Stage two or phase two is what he calls the quality phase. And then phase three is quantity plus quality. And here's what he means. So in the beginning, and I think this is a mistake that I made and other people make because we're so self-conscious about our work, right? Like it, it was funny, even when 
even when you were getting mic'd up, it's like, <laughs> I hate the sound of my own voice. <laughs> And like everyone has that, right? Like even yeah. you see yourself on camera, you're like, I look like such a nerd. Like, <laughs> but really in the beginning, the quantity phase and just putting out like a high volume of content mm -hmm. is really important. And the reason why is you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. You have no idea why people would tune into you. You have no idea even really about like your style of speaking. Mm -hmm your way of communicating, your voice. And so the only way to get through that stage is to just volume, just put out a lot of different content, try different things, uh, try different formats. See what people, works kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. see what works. And, and people will always be like, oh, should I do like short form on TikTok or should I do uh, longer form YouTube videos? The answer, the answer to it, it really depends on like who you are as a person and how you like to communicate. I've always liked in-depth conversations. Mm -hmm. Like even in my life, I'm like that. Like I'm-, I'm Get deep quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I'm long-winded. Yeah. So like short form was never really going to be it, but you really, you have to do the reps and go through the experience to figure out what is gonna be the right thing for you. Yeah. So that's why the quantity phase is so important. And that's, that's like your playground. The quality phase, which is phase two, and I think, Interestingly enough, I would actually say in the life cycle of the podcast, we're kind of in our quality phase yeah. where we have an idea of why people tune in and, and like what works for us. And then now it's about how do you do that, but at a higher level consistently. Mm -hmm. So instead of having one video in five that pops off, you, you're doing it more frequently. You're really locked into what works mm -hmm. uniquely for you. And that's really where you're, you're just honing your voice. You're like just dialing everything in. That, that's phase two. And just to kind of actually give a bit more context to that, I said I'm long-winded. <laughs> I I'm love it, keep going. <laughs> um, and I've seen this actually with all of my guests, even in the businesses that they start, which is essentially what you're doing in the beginning is you're experimenting. You're just firing at a wall. You're just trying to see kind of what sticks. The second you get what I call like signal, yeah. and signal is a moment where, to use the kind of YouTube example, you're putting out videos, every video gets 50 views. And then one day you put out a video and it gets 500 views. That is exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's like the signal. And then as soon as you find the signal, you then double down on that. That kind of shows you directionally like where you should be going. And I always say on, on YouTube, you actually learn more from your wins than your losses. Because when you have a video that succeeds, it gives you kind of like a framework of, okay, yeah. you know, what did I do in the intro? What did I do with thumbnail, title? Uh, how long was the video? It gives you something to base future videos off. So yeah, that's really what you're doing in your quality phase. You're doubling down on what works. Phase three is when you become like a huge channel, um, which is quantity plus quality. And we're kind of trying to, we're in the process of escalating to that where you really understand what you do well uh, you feel like you can do it consistently, but now you need to build more of a team behind the scenes. Um, you need to be able to scale your own time mm -hmm. so that you can do it with the frequency of how you want to do it. And, and I think also a big thing in this content creation uh, game is like a lot of people have been quitting YouTube. And the reason why is like you burn out from this shit. Um, yeah. From always thinking about like, you know, what videos are gonna work and then next? Yeah. booking people. And then also like the numbers can start to get in your head. It's, uh, it's kind of like a funny thing where, you know, a few months ago, I even had to like, kind of have an internal conversation with myself mm -hmm. about this because a few months ago, you would have killed to get like, I don't know, 5,000 views on a video. And then you get 5,000 views in a week and you're like dissatisfied because you have other videos that got way more than that. And so it's easy to kind of get into your head about content creation and like the views and the validation from that. Um, so yeah, I think, in, I think in phase three, it's like you're locking in everything, you're scaling the team, and then you're also kind of taking care of your like mental health, I guess, yeah. as a creator, so you can do it long-term. So yeah, again, not really a short answer. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so um, we have another question here. So. Was there ever a point in your life where you thought you'd not make it and end up being a regular, a regular guy, still doing your nine to five, stressed, broke, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
That's an interesting question. The answer is no. <laughs> Sounds kind of like arrogant. Love that. Strong yeah. no. A strong no. no. Um, the answer is no, but I've definitely had periods and like extended periods where I felt stuck. Um, so the answer is no, because I don't know. I always just had this instinct, belief, even from when I was a kid, like super young, um, that I would do something different and like I would be somebody. And I don't even really know where that comes from. It might be just pure delusion. Um, <laughs> but I felt it even when I was like really young, I just yeah. felt like I was going to do something different. But definitely in the last few years, I've had periods where I felt stuck, yeah. uh, especially when I was working a job. I, there was periods I was like just frustrated uh, and maybe I wasn't like broke, but I was li like I was living in Manhattan in New York. So I don't know. When you live in Manhattan, you feel broke, even though like, really? you're, you're making quite a lot of money. But it's Is it like London in that sense? Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's worse than London. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, cause I, so I grew, up, I grew up in London. Mm -hmm. And then when I graduated uni, which is like four years ago, five years ago, I moved to New Jersey and then I moved to New York. And so it's funny coming back to London now. It's like London. And I know this is going to seem weird. London almost feels a bit cheap, uh, cheap to me. Really? Just because New York is so See, I've insane. never had to say that, so. Yeah. L <laughs> London is expensive. Yeah. But New York takes it to a different level. But I, I remember one of those periods, actually, I remember it quite vividly where I felt stuck. And it's my last year when I was working, like I had like a normal nine to five and working a job. And, you know, when, you, when you're working at a company, they have like their review cycles or like their promotion cycles. So it wasn't a promotion cycle, but it was like a review of performance. And I've always been someone that like, I like to be on the front foot. And so I'm speaking with my manager. We get to the end of the call and I mentioned to him, uh, like getting a promotion or getting a pay rise. And I remember it so vividly, even now he was like completely shocked. Like he was like completely, I could just tell taken off guard. It was it was like such a frustrating thing to me that it wasn't it kind of confirmed in my mind that like it wasn't even like a thought in his head that I would get a pay rise, like I would get a promotion or like yeah. added responsibility. And I think I've always kind of wanted to move things forward and been like impatient mm -hmm. with wanting to progress and like see myself move forward. And if I don't feel like I'm moving forward, I'm like pissed, like I'm irritated. Yeah. Yeah. And so. I didn't get a pay rise at that time, obviously. Ugh. And it was one of those things where it was just it was just frustrating to me at the time that it wasn't even like a consideration. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't even something that he thought about. And so I wanted to feel like I was like in kind of like in charge and in control of my own career. And I was like at the effect, like I was at the cause of it. Like I was the one pushing it forward rather than waiting for someone to feel like I was like needed a promotion or was like deserving of a promotion. So yeah, and I remember it's actually, that was the moment where I was like, okay, like I'm gonna leave in the next six to 12 months. Yeah. Like that was the time I'd really decided it after that experience. That, that was a difficult period because it's like you live two lives. So I was working on the podcast, essentially when I'd get home from work from like six till midnight. And then I would like wake up the next day and then go to work from like eight till six, eight till five, whatever. And you almost feel like you live like a double life and you yeah. feel fatigued all the time because you're like working two things. Uh, but that sixth month period where I was working at the podcast, still earning money from my job is like pivotal to where I am now. So yeah, in, in answer to your question, like I never felt like I would be there forever, but I definitely felt stuck and I definitely felt frustrated yeah. Yeah. Uh, at my situation. Uh, but it's different now, so it's cool. Yeah. You had that like hunger, you know. Like, yeah, I just wanted to do more. Yeah, yeah. So what do you make of the diary of a CEO comparisons? Yeah. Do you think they're accurate? Um, and do you take any inspiration from Stephen at all? Yeah, that's interesting. So um it's kind of something that's happened in the last few weeks where uh we started getting like a lot of comments on the videos of like, oh, really? oh this is like diary of a CEO or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I think my honest answer is I find it kind of flattering, to be honest. I think sometimes people mean it like as an insult or a diss, but I find it kind of flattering. Obviously, like Steven and what their team over there is doing is they're like kind of at the top of the genre. 
and they do things to such a higher level than other podcasts that I see. And they really kind of set the bar in that sense. And so I think the comparisons mean that we're doing something right. Yeah. Now, at the same time, how much do we look to their content and their stuff? I think it's not so much the content or the questions itself. It's how they operate and move as a team. And so like, what do I even mean when I say that? It's the kind of the mindset that they take to the content. So if you, if you listen to Steven or people on his team, he'll talk a lot about experimentation. Mm. The fact that they're always trying new things and they're always trying to find these kind of like 1% improvements in the content. And so when I'm speaking with my team, I really try and internalize that and live that out as well of like, how can we consistently make the experience? How can we make the content uh, more hard hitting, more impactful, more inspirational to the audience? Um, and just having like that real audience first lens and also just like making it a great experience for the guests. And I think one of the things I, I heard this about Steven, I think he even said it actually. One of the things that they do just to show like the level of detail that they go in. So obviously the guests come to their studio and there's like a waiting area. So before they start recording, the guests just waiting there. They've figured out before the guest arrives what their favorite music is wow. and they will play it <laughs> as the guest is waiting there so they're in like a better mood wait without asking them any questions no. or anything they just, they're just waiting there but they're just like incredible. yeah and it's just I, I had the same reaction where i was like that is insane that yeah. they go to that level of depth because there's, there's literally so much that come that goes into filming a, a podcast episode yeah. I think people don't often see it, but like the research, like knowing your questions and then you're like getting production. There's, there's so much stuff that's happening on the day. And so that level of care in the product is, yeah, it's like, it's incredible that they do that and they do that in every sense. And so I think the inspiration that I take from Steven is like, we're going to take that. We're going to be that obsessed about uh, this experience and mm. every part of it. We're going to optimize to that level, but I really want to be like in my own lane. And I think, I think as, as we continue to learn, we continue to put out episodes and we continue to improve, uh, increasingly we will be in our own lane and like maybe there'll be podcasts getting compared to us. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I reckon so. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool. What has changed since you got more viewers or well, since you've had a bigger audience? Yeah, no, that's a good question. You're doing a great job, by the way, Meg. Ah, oh, thanks. We need, we need money to get you back. <laughs> um, I'll come back. <laughs> So what changed? Um, it's interesting. I feel like there's so much that's changed. And like, so, so we really blew up in November. We had a video that got over 700,000 views and then everything kind of followed from that. I think really since January, it's like my life has been a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. Even what I said in the beginning, I live in New Jersey and then record in New York. But since January or in the last, I would say eight weeks, I've been to Miami to record. I've been to Atlanta, back to New York, and now in London for like the last two weeks. So I think in terms of my life, like it's been crazy and there's been a lot of stuff kind of happening behind the scenes and like trying to grow the team and get the right sort of guests. It's been a lot like personally. I think in terms of the content, I don't know. I, I think we, what I was saying earlier, like we're still trying to improve every aspect of the videos, really starting to dial in like the sort of guests that the audience resonate with. And I think there was, um, I even wrote this in my notes, just getting really clear on like the mission and why people tune in. And I even said that, you know what, let me even actually read this where I go. Every incredible moment starts with faith. And it starts with challenging the thing we struggle the most with as humans. That is trusting and believing that we are enough. Our instinct is enough. Our feeling is enough. Our judgment is enough. We can do the thing that we want with no limits. Trusting that something can make sense to no one but yourself and therefore be the right decision for you. And um, I think kind of as this has started to take off and it like, like my whole life is about it and I've been able to like support myself through doing it. It's just demonstrated that like there is not really a limit, especially with the internet and the way things are today. There's not a limit on what you can do. 
not to say it's going to be easy because it's definitely not and there's there's a lot that comes with it but i don't know it, it's definitely confirmed in my mind like first of all you can do whatever you want and even if when you're saying it in the beginning people are like are kind of skeptical or don't even believe you there will be a point if you stick at it where it makes sense and then everyone's going to say that they believed it or saw it in the beginning so i think i think that's the first thing is it's like solidified my confidence in that sense I think what else has changed? You know, actually, there's this, I remember there's a story where when the podcast first started really gaining traction and it was funny because people like around me, like family members or even past guests that we'd had that like support the show and everything were getting really excited. I remember at the time I didn't feel anything. I didn't really feel excited. I didn't feel happiness. I felt like a slight hint of relief because we'd been posting episodes week after week and at the time it didn't feel like it was getting traction. And so I think we'd, we'd posted for, for 45 straight weeks every week without fail and it was not really getting traction. And so when one finally did, I just felt like a hint of relief more so than anything. And then I felt pressure to do it again. That was kind of where my mind was. And I remember I'm having a call with my business coach, Maya. Shout out to Maya because she's incredible. And I'm speaking with her and I'm telling her, I'm like, Maya, this is our moment. Like, we need to capitalize. Like, this is our moment. And she stops me and she goes, stop calling it your moment. Your moment implies that it's fleeting. Like, it's going to go away. Like, it's a temporary thing. And then she says to me something which I'll always remember. She says, this isn't your moment. This is your new reality. And... I love that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I remember it's like, it made me even pause. I was like, this is my new reality. And then she said, if this is your new reality, how would you behave from here? So if it's just the common thing that you now have this platform and people tune in and they subscribe and they love the content, how would you move? What would be the team that you would assemble? How would you invest in the show? And so at the time it was a complete 180 and we just, I just started investing into the podcast in a way that I'd never done before. And so that was really the, the inspiration behind all of the trips to record. It was the inspiration behind giving pay rises to people on my team. It was the inspiration, I don't know, behind coming back to London for a month to record it as well. Uh, investing more in production was like, this is the new reality for us and we're just gonna invest in it. Like that's the case. And now I just think it is the case. And we're getting those views like way more consistently. Yeah. And so I think that was the biggest thing is believing that you didn't just get lucky or like it was like a one-off thing that you actually deserve this and it's happening for a reason and then stepping in that every day. So I, I think that's probably been the biggest mindset shift. Yeah, I, I think there's like more minor things, or not minor, but there's just things that have come from that, which is just more of an, an incentive and more of like a motivator for us to improve because so many people are tuned in. And like people I actually love our comment section because people will notice like the smallest things. Um, it's actually funny. I have this, there's this episode I recorded with this creator. He's great. Uh, I speak with him quite often, actually. His name's Kane Calloway. Recorded it in New York. It's the only episode that I've recorded where I was wearing glasses and not contacts. <laughs> and I remember I put the episode out and it, and it did really well. But like so many people in my comment section, because I just got these new frames and they weren't like fitted, like, right? Uh, what, I don't too know. Big, too small? No, nah, it was just like they kept slipping down. <laughs> and so as I'm speaking, I'm like readjusting them. And then the second the video goes out, like people are commenting and it's like, it's like, oh, she's really great interview, but like he should really get new glasses. Or like, he, why does he keep pushing up the glasses? Um, yeah, they seem to. Pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, how the hell did people even notice that? But yeah, people notice everything. And so it's actually cool. I think it's like, a, it's a blessing that people like care and they're like tuned in and they're giving you feedback like that. So I think, yeah, the stakes are like higher now. Um, and so, yeah, it's more of like, uh, there's more of an incentive just to get everything right. And like, you know, mm -hmm. to lock in everything and to be better, which I appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's it.
I personally feel motivated right now. <laughs> like, that's what I needed to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I needed, glad. I needed to hear all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I think it's cool. And I think one of the things actually that you see through the podcast is like everyone has their own story mm -hmm. and everyone's story is interesting. And I think a lot of the times we don't believe our own story is interesting. Like we don't think that anyone would give a fuck. Like we, and I, I remember, especially in the beginning when I was starting the podcast, I just didn't think my viewpoint was interesting. Like I didn't think anyone would tune in. And so that's even why I started it with like interviewing other people. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I can ask questions and like people will care about them. As the podcast has progressed, it's like, you know, we, we changed the name even to the Callum Johnson show. And it was like a sign of like, okay, like I'm really building that confidence. Like people care about my story. Like it's interesting, but it's not just my story. Like everyone's story is interesting. And I think once you really believe that, it's like, you're going to start moving in a different way. Mm -hmm. You're going to start sharing more and understanding like they're in Megan's shoes, but like Megan's shoes from like three years ago. And the advice you could give them right now would like impact them in a way that no one else could. I might start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what you do. We'll just <laughs> sprout up podcasts over yeah. here. You know what? To the audience, uh, let me know what you think about episodes and, you know, more solo episodes like this, because we can do this and we can make it like a regular thing, just kind of check in, catch up with each other. So, yeah, thank you for tuning in.